our galaxy, the Milky Way, is thought to be 13 billion years old, having formed when the universe was just 800 million years old. But how do we actually know that? To put a number on this, what we have to do is unravel the history of the Milky Way and how it's come to look like it does today. In the same way that you don't look like you did when you were first born, the Milky Way won't have looked like it does today when its first stars were formed. So to figure this out, we need to work out how many stars formed in the Milky Way and when, and then from their orbits, we need to work out if they actually formed in the Milky Way itself rather than forming in another galaxy that then merged with the Milky Way. So once you know, okay, these stars definitely formed in the Milky Way, and this seems to be like the oldest patch of the Milky Way, you then need to work out how old those stars actually are. So how do we do that? Well, that is something that Xiang and Rix did just last year using new observations from the Gaia mission. It's an ESA telescope currently keeping JWST company orbiting Lagrange point two, 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. And the Gaia mission aims to record the brightness, position, distances, and velocities of just under a billion stars in the Milky Way. And it does that by tracking the position of those stars incredibly precisely over over a number of years. So in that time, the Gaia telescope is actually orbiting the sun. So its perspective on the stars actually changes. And so from its perspective, the stars appear to wobble on the sky in the same way that if you put a finger up at arm's length and then you close one eye and then the other and switch between them, you see your finger moving with respect to the objects in the background. So in this analogy, your left eye is like, what Gaia sees during the summer months and your right eye is what Gaia sees during the winter months when it's on the other side of the sun and your finger here is a star. This is what we call parallax and it's what allows us to work out the distance to stars. But the stars are also orbiting the center of the Milky Way along with the sun. So they're gonna move in the direction of their orbit, something known as proper motion. So the two effects combine, proper motion and parallax to give this like spiral light motion across the sky, which is greatly exaggerated in the video I'm showing here. But what Gaia also does is take a spectrum of each star as well. This is where it takes the light and passes it through a prism and splits it into its component wavelengths, essentially to make like a trace of how much light at each wavelength you detect from a star. What that allows us to do is work out the properties of a star. So how hot a star is and what it's made of. Bigger stars are much hotter and give out more light at bluer wavelengths, whereas smaller stars are much cooler and give out more light at redder wavelengths. So they have very distinctive traces of light in their spectra. Plus you can also see that we've got missing wavelengths in the spectra gaps caused by elements in the atmospheres of the stars themselves absorbing or stealing away light at that very specific wavelength that's unique to that element. And it's the same wherever you are in the universe. So the pattern of these gaps that you have essentially tells us if the light has been shifted either to redder wavelengths or bluer wavelengths because the star is moving away or towards us. And that's just a Doppler shift, right? It's the same effect that happens when you hear an ambulance siren and if it's coming towards you, the wave gets squashed a bit to a higher pitch sound wave. Whereas if it's moving away from you, the wave gets stretched out to a lower pitch sound wave. The same thing happens light, but instead of the pitch changing of the sound, it's the color of the light that changes. That's how Gaia gets a 3D picture of the Milky Way, essentially a map with how the stars are moving as well. And from that, you can then tell whether stars formed in the Milky Way itself or outside of it, because they have a different pattern to their velocities, the most famous of which is called the Gaia Enceladus Sausage, because they separate out from other stars observed by Gaia in velocity space into a sausage-like shape. So first we're going to use those velocities to isolate out the stars that actually formed in situ, so inside the Milky Way itself, and then we've got to work out, okay, how old are all those stars? So how do we do that? <laughs> Well, from our knowledge of how much energy nuclear fusion gives off, which is the process by which stars power themselves, converting hydrogen into helium, and then how gravity works, we can then work out how quickly a star of a certain size has to convert that hydrogen into helium to resist the crush of gravity inwards just from how much stuff is there in the star. And from that, you can work out that the most massive, hottest stars have to do that conversion of hydrogen into helium to fuel themselves at such an incredible incredible rate to counteract the much stronger gravity crushing them inwards that they actually die 
first. After only a few hundred thousand years or so, leaving behind the cooler, fainter, smaller stars that live much longer. You can actually see this if you look at a collection of stars that have all formed at the same time, like globular clusters, for example, and you make a plot of the temperature against the brightness, then if it's quite a young cluster, you'll have all the stars on this correlation, right up to the hottest and the brightest ones. But as the cluster gets older, those hottest, brightest stars die off and go supernova, and the amount of stars you have on this correlation shrinks. You have this turn off as stars turn into red giants and eventually go supernova. So we know to look for the coolest, smallest, and annoyingly faintest stars to actually search for the oldest, but knowing how old they actually are is when we have to start modeling what they look like. So we use all our combined knowledge of nuclear physics and quantum physics and thermodynamics and fluid dynamics of how all stars behave to work out how much light of each wavelength they give off, i.e. what their spectrum looks like and how that changes as they get older and with what they're made of. Because if you think about it, if you have a star made of pure hydrogen as opposed to one that's like polluted by the heavier elements like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, then you're gonna have a different pattern in those gaps in the spectrum because the absorption is different in the atmosphere of these stars. And this is crucial because the Big Bang Theory tells us that the very early universe was made of pretty much pure hydrogen, maybe with some trace uh, helium and lithium, some slightly heavier elements, just because hydrogen is the simplest thing that you can form. But then as you started to make the first stars, which eventually when they die and go supernova, produce the heavier elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all the way up to iron, they then explode and disperse those elements across the universe. So the next generation of stars is not made from pure hydrogen, but from a mix of all different things. So what we do is we collect a lot of spectra from what we think are the coolest, oldest stars, so the biggest sample we can get our hands on. And then we try and fit them with our models, varying, okay, how old do we think this star is and varying what the star is made of until we find the best fit model. And then we just look, okay, well, which one is the oldest? And that gives us some limit for how old is the Milky Way if that's its oldest star. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainties on this method. As you can imagine, our models aren't perfect at all. And usually you end up with an uncertainty on your measurement of give or take a billion years either side. Now, that's not the only way we can get the ages of stars. There's a couple other methods as well. Like, for example, uh, one called gyrochronology, which is all about the spin of stars. So Skuminich in 1972 realized there was a relation between the speed a star was rotating at and the age of the star. So if you can work out, okay, how fast is a star rotating, then you can work out how old it is, which is great, except it's in practice very difficult to do, especially for a very faint star, which are the oldest stars, because you need some tracer on the star's surface to be able to know like when it's come back round, like say we do for the surface of Mars, for example, or like on Jupiter with the great red spot, we know how Jupiter is rotating because of how often the great red spot comes back around to the same position. So you can do this if you have like a star spot on the surface of a star, but again, they're very difficult to spot on a small faint star. Another method for getting at the age of the star is to first get an extremely precise distance using that parallax method that I was talking about before, for example, and then take images of the star through filters that only let through certain wavelengths. These are much easier to get than a spectrum, so it's done more often. It's often the data that you can get your hands on, but with the incredibly precise distance, you then know the star's absolute brightness rather than the brightness that it appears to us because it's a, quite a distance away. And then using that, again, you can model for how much light the, the star should be giving out, all these different wavelengths, and you can fit those models to get in an age. But again, that's incredibly uncertain. Now the claim for the oldest star was made with that method by Bond and collaborators in 2013 for the star HD 140283. And they found an age of 14.46 plus or minus 0.8 billion years. Which means that our best estimate for the age of this star is somewhere between 13.66 and 15.26 billion years old. Now the age of the universe, like our best estimate for it, is 13.8 
billion years old. So that just gives you an idea of how imprecise these methods are because it's not possible to have a star that's older than the universe. No matter how many media outlets reported it like that at the time and dubbed it the Methuselah star. I have a whole video on this topic if you want to check it out. So really what you want to do to account for these uncertainties on individual star age measurements is find many stars that you can do this with instead. Which is exactly what Jiang and Rix did last year for what's known as sub-giant stars. This is a phase that all stars go through in their evolution, so it's when they run out of hydrogen to fuse into helium in the core of the star where the nuclear fusions are actually taking place because it's hot enough and dense enough to do that. And so because you've got no sort of power out from the middle anymore, all of a sudden gravity starts to win in trying to compress everything inwards. But as it does that, you then increase the density and temperature enough so that you can start fusing hydrogen into helium again just in a shell around the core. And then the star puffs up a little bit again to compensate for uh, the energy that's now being put back out again. And you can see this subgiant phase in that diagram I was talking about before of the brightness of the star against the temperature. You can see it at that turnoff stage where stars enter the subgiant phase before becoming actual giants and then going supernova. Now, the smallest and coolest of stars, we're talking like, you know, like less than 40% of the mass of the sun here, they live so long that we've never seen any of those stars enter this subgiant phase because they are able to, you know, fuse hydrogen into helium for longer than the current age of the universe. But if we can find the smallest and oldest of stars that are currently in this subgiant phase, then you can work out that's how long the first stars to have formed in the Milky Way have been around and put an age on the Milky Way. The problem is it's a very short-lived phase for stars that are that small. So it's very unlikely that you ever catch any stars in that phase unless you have a massive sample to start with, like for example, the almost 1 billion stars that the Gaia mission is targeting. So Xiang and Rix managed to find 250,000 subgiant stars of all sizes in the Gaia data, and then fit models to them to work out their ages and what they're made of. Again, if you just look at the stars that have velocities that suggest they formed in the Milky Way itself, in situ, then the ones with the lowest concentration of heavy elements are fitted best by models with an age of around 13 billion years. So the redder the colour here, the more likely a model with that age is. So that puts our current best estimate for the age of the Milky Way at 13 billion years old, with the first stars in the Milky Way having formed when the universe was just 800 million years old. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this week's video. I have been a big fan of Brilliant.org for a long time. I think it's one of the best ways to learn science or maths interactively, getting you to learn by doing so that you don't just learn something by rote, but instead get like a proper physical intuition for what is going on. So if you're wondering how do we actually train machines to fit models to data or to classify images, like in astronomy to classify, say, the shapes of galaxies or in medicine to make diagnoses, check out Brilliant's Introduction to Neural Networks course, which is honestly one of the best courses for beginners that I've ever seen on this topic. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky to let them know that I sent you, or you can click on that link in the video description down below. Plus the first 200 of you that go to that link are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, we're all those bloopers. Lulu. Are you focused on my face? Hi, it's me. Hi, I promise me. When is Taylor Swift gonna announce an international era's tour? Just asking for a friend. And that's just a Doppler shift. So it's the same thing that you hear when like an ambulance siren is wa wasting, it's wasting towards you. Having formed when the universe was just 800 million years old. Oh, we had a little lip twitch then. Did anyone else see that? As either another method is called gyrochronology. Gyrochronology? Like a gyroscope or like a gynecologist? 
<laughs> I'm gonna go with gyroscope. <laughs> Gy gyro chronology. Do you know what? I'm I'm just happy I was in the right ballpark on my first attempt, to be quite honest, because you know what I say, space is hard, words are harder. Pull out the methods. One method is called uh I've already forgotten what I was gonna say. This is the phage phage? <laughs> The phage in all stars evolution. You're going through a phage of life right now. 